Childhood and Neurodevelopmental Disorders. Neurodevelopmental Disorders. There are several neurodevelopmental disorders. The first one is communication disorder. There's motor disorders, tick disorders, specific learning disorders, and intellectual disabilities. The first one that we're gonna discuss is communication disorders. They are language and speech sounds. In language disorders, these individuals have a difficulty in attaining and using language due to deficits in production or comprehension of language. They are also expressive and receptive. In a speech sound disorder, these individuals have problems making sounds. Other communication disorders are childhood onset fluency disorders. That is also known as stuttering. There's also a disorder called social communication disorder. These individuals have problems using verbal and nonverbal means for interacting socially with others. The motor disorders are developmental and stereotypic. In the developmental coordination disorders, these individuals have impairments in motor skills. They also have developmental issues. And all of these problems interfere, interfere with their academic performance and their daily living. Stereotypic movement disorders, these individuals have repetitive purposeless movements and they last for four weeks or more. They wave, they rock, they bang their head, they bite their nails, they grind their teeth. Now this is long-term movements for four weeks or more. There are also tick disorders. These individuals have sudden non-rhythmic and rapid motor movements or vocalizations. There are three different tick disorders, provisional, persistent, Tourette's. These are important. However, we will not be focusing on these disorders. These are some ways of treating tick disorders. You have the behavioral therapies, you have medications, and you have deep brain stimulation. As with the last slide, this slide is for informational purposes only. We will only be discussing it very briefly. Then we have specific learning disorders. That would be dyslexia, dyscalcia, dysgraphia. Those have to do with reading, math, and written expression. Individuals with intellectual development disorders, they have deficits in intellect, social functioning, and daily functioning. What is the application of our nursing process? We're going to assess for delays. We're going to assess for signs of potential neglect or abuse. Then we're going to formulate our diagnoses. We're going to look at what outcomes we want to have. Each Each thing that we do for a patient, of course, is individualized. And then, of course, as the end, we're going to evaluate whether or not we had positive or negative results. If we have positive results, yay! If we have negative results, we're going to start over and see what else we can do for the client. Autism spectrum disorder. We're going to focus on this one and one other, but right now as we talk about autism, um, we note that autism is a persistent deficit in social communication and social interaction. These individuals are unable to reciprocate socially and emotionally. A lot of times they're very nonverbal. 
and they are unable to develop, maintain, and understand most relationships. You need to know that children, individuals with autism, they're restrictive, they like repetitive patterns of behavior and interest or anxiety, I mean, or activities. Now, when we have restrictive, repetitive patterns of behaviors, interests, or uh, activities, keep in mind we have to worry about this listing of information. This is DSM-5 box on page 178. This box is important. I'm going to need you to make sure that you are very, very familiar with this box. It's extremely important. Now we're going to talk about what are we going to do. We are going to, with these clients, implement some sort of reward system. If we want a certain kind of behavior, we need to reward them for the positive behavior so they will learn that if they do certain behaviors, which is positive, that they will get a reward and more than likely they are going to continue to do the positive behavior that we have wanted them to do. We also need to make sure that the parents are educated on how they are going to interact with their child, how they can focus with the child's strengths and abilities in order to be able to function effectively. Another disorder we're going to talk about that's extremely important is ADHD. It is an, a disorder that has something to do with an inability to control yourself or a client that's very impulsive. These individuals are going to have an inappropriate degree of inattention, impulsiveness, and hyperactivity meaning they are not going to be able to pay attention. They are going to be very impulsive, very hyperactive. On a side note, they have taken away the actual diagnoses of ADD, and now all of it is called ADHD. Let's talk about assessment for a few minutes. What are we going to be assessing for? What kind of activity are they doing? How is their attention span? Are they talking too much? Do they have any social skills? We're not really going to worry too much about core mobility. We are going to find out if the symptoms of these individuals present in, in at least two settings. Normally, it's going to be at home and at school, depending on the age of the child. All right, let's talk about implementation. You've got to have the individual group and family therapy. With the individual, we are going to discuss with them ways that they may be able to be more in tune with what they can do in order to be able to pay more attention. In group therapy, that is the time where they are going to be able to see a little bit of positive modeling. And we remember what modeling is, where I do something positive behavior-wise hoping that you will observe what I'm doing and follow suit. And then we have ther family therapy, because if the family does not know how to interact or the patient does not know how to interact, then it becomes a complete mess. So we have to get with these families and pretty much teach them how to interact with their child or their loved one or whatever you want to call it. How are we going to manage disruptive behaviors? First of all, there's going to be a behavioral contract. 
any behavioral contract. It'd be just like me saying, okay, well, I've had 15 speeding tickets. Well, somebody would make a behavioral contract with me that I wouldn't drive fast anymore. And what would that mean? If I say, okay, I promise I'm not gonna drive fast anymore. I am contracting with you that I'm not gonna drive fast. Therefore, I'm not gonna get speeding tickets anymore. Also, of course, we're going to have counseling. There's that modeling again, mm, role playing, not so much, planned ignoring. We're not even going to talk about that. The signals and gestures, physical distance and touch or co uh, control. All of those are good things. But on this slide, the only management we're going to discuss and worry about is that behavioral contract where I am, I meaning the client, am doing something that is unhelpful, unsafe, undesirable, and you have asked me to promise you that I will not do it anymore. What are, how, how are we going to do it? We're going to redirect. Sometimes redirection looks like a reward. So-and-so is acting horrible during group. So what am I going to do as the nurse? I'm going to take them out of the group setting. I'm going to take them swimming. I'm going to take them walking around the track. I'm going to take them to do whatever it is that I can do with them to create a positive situation for them. Yes, that looks like a reward, but what happens is the child is taken away from the setting that they're disrupting. They're also allowing time for the other people in the group to be able to pay attention, be able to um, get something out of the group appropriately. So remember, redirection sometimes looks like a reward. Looks like a reward. We get down here to the bottom and we talk about physical restraints. Now, y'all studied about the physical restraints in several different modules. Physical restraints, very important. They are never a PRN, ever, ever, ever. You have to have a um, order from a physician. And you also need to think about that even though a patient care tech or someone in that aspect can sit with that client, it is ultimately the nurse's responsibility to be responsible for that patient. There is never, ever, ever a reason to have a PRN order for a physical restraint or any restraint. And the RN, the nurse, is the one that is ultimately responsible for the care and well-being of that client. Now, how are we going to evaluate? We're going to focus on those symptoms. What kind of symptoms? How often does it happen? What are they doing academically? Are they able to sit still? Are they ever are they able to have positive relationships with others? Are they going to be able to control themselves? Um, and have that impulse control. Now, pharmacotherapy, that's medication. We're going to use medications to increase this attention and task-directed behavior. Now, those are the stimulants. We'll talk about them again later. And then we have the medications for aggressive behavior, 
a lot of times those are when the antipsychotics come into play. And there we are again, training the parents in behavioral therapy. That's the way they, they will learn how they are to interact with this child so this child can perform and get along in the household and then everybody gets CBT. All right, what are our goals? Main goal, we're re reducing that hyperactivity. That impulse control is going to be better. They're not gonna get injured because they're not gonna be impulsively jumping off furniture and flipping and flopping. They're gonna be able to interact better socially. They're gonna have better self-esteem because if they're interacting more appropriately, then people are gonna wanna be around them and they are gonna be able to function better with their family. These are the most used medications for ADHD. Um, Adamoxetine, methylphenidate. There are several others. The main point for these medications is that they are stimulants. You need to give them in the morning. You need to monitor for weight loss. You need to, of course, monitor for insomnia. And then with children or adults with uncontrolled aggression, those are the ones that are going to need the various antipsychotics.